जर्नी बिन Well um so I I started studying economics with a quite a, a defined interest in uh the the challenge of development of countries right so how how countries get to to develop how the the incomes of the population get to grow um and uh, I well I did a, a degree in Uruguay and then I moved to the UK to do a PhD uh where I studied how um a particular type of uncertainty that relates to to how the real exchange rate uh, frequently moves and so creates uh, uncertainty for for agents how it affects uh, production decisions right uh, and this is something that is very important for for development because in developing countries there is much more uncertainty so understanding the challenges that that are associated with uncertainty and the channels that link uh uncertainty with production decisions and therefore with with output growth and therefore with incomes and job creation uh is something that is quite important so I, i was doing my phd and then i i got approached by by the world bank to work on a specific assignment um in indonesia at that time and i took a summer off uh, from my phd went to indonesia worked on that uh and got very excited about the the prospect of a career in 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 development in the world bank so the world bank probably is one of the if not the best place to work in development uh one of the best uh and so when i had the opportunity when i finished the phd i i started uh working for the bank first uh, in the in a, the global trade unit that is a a unit that looks at a trade issues uh, without a specific country focus so uh, you know across the across the world right um and then i moved into more country specific type of engagements and and i ended up in pakistan actually working on very cool very cool you mentioned the real exchange rate and i feel like that is something that's really missed in pakistan uh for 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 most people what's the difference between a real exchange rate and the exchange rate that we see is that isn't that the real exchange rate essentially well the exchange rate uh basically is is in the case of pakistan uh the exchange rate now is about 171 to 1 what does that mean it means that if you put 1 dollar on the table someone will come with 171 rupees and will give you 171 rupees for for the dollar right is basically the price of the dollar expressed in 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 domestic currency right. now uh the the evolution of the exchange rate uh, tells you many things for example it tells you uh what is happening with the price of imported things when right. the, when the the dollar becomes more expensive then imports uh, become more expensive imports right? yeah. become more expensive but what the real part adds is basically it adds how uh, the evolution of the of the of the nominal exchange rate of that n- normal exchange rate i mentioned 171 rupees to the dollar in the case of pakistan how the evolution of domestic prices affect that parity right so okay. say for example if um if if domestic prices are growing a lot right right and also the price of the dollar uh in pakistan increases a lot then uh, it may also be that the wages of people are also growing at the same rate right. and so import prices from the perspective of the purchasing power of Pakistanis are not changing in real terms so they are changing in nominal terms so you go to the shop and instead of paying uh, say 150 rupee for something that uh, before costed 1 dollar now you have to pay 171 right so that's a 20 rupee extra you have to pay but yeah. perhaps your salary also increased by 20 rupees extra right right so what the, the important thing when one looks at how exchange rates affect uh, real decisions the decisions of firms to produce uh or to import or export uh that is affected by the real exchange rate so by by the price of the rupee or the price of the dollar in rupees relative to what is happening with prices in in the domestic economy right and i think that's um because recently this was like a part of a big debate we saw the dollar just sort of 
I mean, slipping away, went up to 175 before sort of coming back to 171. Um, and I know that you are, you have a you have core focus on exports and trying to understand, you know, how exports sort of help in developing uh, economies like Pakistan. I know that you guys recently came out with a report as well. Uh, you know, the World Bank came out with a very detailed report. Can you tell us a little bit about that report? Yes, yes. Uh, so we just released uh, last Thursday, actually, the Pakistan Development Update uh, is the fall issue for 2021. We had a, an issue in the spring that was released in April. This is the, the fall issue. Uh, and this is basically a macro update that tells us a little bit of what is happening in, in the economy, uh, what do we expect, what the outlook is for, for the economy. But it had uh, a specific focus in this case that is a focus on reviving exports. Right. Um, and, uh, well, as, as, as I, I lead the trade, uh, the trade engagement of the World Bank with Pakistan, that was uh, a focus I, I worked quite, quite a lot on. Um, right. The real exchange rate actually is, a, is a, a very important determinant of reviving exports. If one right. wants to, so if you talk to exporters, exporters look look quite closely at what is happening with, with the exchange rate because it's a crucial element in their profitability, right? Right. Changes in the exchange rate make them one day profitable, another day uh, not profitable. So, right. so they, they, they really pay attention to what is happening with, with that variable. Right. Do you think a, um, a, a dollar getting more expensive is essentially harmful for the economy? Or is, this, is, that, is that like an arbitrary thing and it in, in, entirely depends on the underlying indicators? Well, the price of the dollar affects many things. So right. I cannot possibly answer that question with a single answer. So for right. example, the, when the dollar gets more expensive, exporters get happier, right? right. Because their costs are mainly in rupees, right. but their, the price they get, so their profits are mostly associated with the revenues are associated with the price of the dollar. So they get more rupees per dollar, they can pay the salaries of their workers and keep a larger share. So the, their right. profits increase when the dollar, the, when the currency depreciates, right? When the, the dollar becomes more expensive. So for exporters, a depreciated rupee is good news. Okay. As long as domestic prices don't grow too much, right? Because right. remember, it's, it's the real that matters. Right. But but the story doesn't end there, right? So the the, the evolution of exchange rate also determines, for example, uh, the burden of the debt of a country. Right. The country has a, an important portion of that debt denominated in dollars. So right. Pakistan, for example, uh, is, is, is a country that get, gets most of its revenues in, in rupees because tax, the tax base is in rupees. Right. Uh, but if it has to serve a lot of the debt uh, in dollars, then it will have a mismatch of currencies there. Your income uh, is in, in rupee, but your part of your your outflows are in are in dollars. So in, in that respect, a dollar increases the burden of increases the price of the dollar increases the burden of the debt. There's also an impact that a depreciation of the uh, rupee has on inflation because right. of course it affects import prices, and through import prices, it affects the prices of many things. Right. Uh, Particularly so, like energy, for example, because that's all, everything that energy, we're importing, right? So, food prices. Right. The, the price of any tradable good, of any good that is traded or could potentially be traded, is going to be affected by the by the exchange rate. And so, if if you have a you know a rapid depreciation, then that's going to translate to some extent into what is happening with inflation. So that right. affects the purchasing power of people that have fixed incomes, right? right. Affects negatively the purchasing power of people that have a salary that is fixed and won't change uh, very frequently. Right. So as you see, the, 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 the exchange rate has very different impacts on different variables. So it's, it's difficult to, to tell, uh, you know, overall whether it's this a is a good thing, thing or not. Thing. What, right. what we know from evidence, from, uh, you know, from empirical evidence, that looks at developing countries is that typically, not always, but typically, a depreciation of the real exchange rate is going to be in the long term good for growth. Right. Uh, so there is a, a paper uh, written by Danny Rodrik that is a leading uh, econo development economist um, from, from Turkey, actually, but lives in, in the US and works in Harvard, uh, that, that actually shows how uh, countries that have a relatively depreciated currency for long periods are countries that 
uh, typically are going to end up growing faster in the de developing countries, right? Focusing on developing countries. And why is that? Because a depreciated currency makes more resources be allocated into tradable sectors, into exportable sectors, because right. it increases the profitability of exports. And so the export sector expands in the economy, right. consumption shrinks. And so right. you tilt the growth model to a model in which exports play a larger role than consumption in explaining growth. Right. Uh, and the export sector tends to be more dynamic, uh, and therefore you end up growing faster. So this is this is an, an empirical regularity that Roderick unveiled in this paper in 2008. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I think it holds uh, it, it may also hold in, 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 in for the case of Pakistan, right? Uh, it's, it's sort of a push to get more firms looking at the external sector, the external markets, rather than looking inwards um, with associated long-term gains on productivity, right? Firms, right. when they look more outwards than inwards, they end up learning more. Right. Their efficiency increases. Um, and so in the long term, they create more and better jobs wages increase, it's, it's, it's tends to be good news for, for right. the economy. So just to, just to sort of put, put that into context, my understanding, um, what you're essentially saying is that if, for example, if a country is come, is if, the, if a company is looking to invest in Pakistan, in a stable exchange rate, they will most likely be investing in a inward um, sort of a business where they're saying, you know, we're creating products for the consumers within the country and they're going to consume it and we can take the profits out. If the money is being depreciated, the numbers would not make that much sense for them to be selling in PKR and then taking the profits out. They would rather invest in areas which would be export driven because that is all dollar denominated. Is that correct? Well, let's put it this way. If the if an economy has an artificially high exchange rate, so a relatively appreciated rupee. Right. Yeah. Artificially held, right? By some intervention of a, of a central bank right uh, is likely that the type of investment it attracts is in non trade in the non tradable sector because the right. tradable sector is not very profitable in that economy right, right? because it's more profitable to import things right. rather than to produce them at home right yeah so then the type of investment you're going to get is an investment focusing on the non tradable sector if instead you have a more depreciated currency you're likely to attract the type of investment that will focus on Trade producing and, and things. Producing things, Producing right. things at home and selling them at home or abroad. Right. Because that's going to be more profitable. Right. Uh, that tends to be associated with faster productivity growth. Right. right? I'm not saying that depreciated currencies are good it's for good everyone. Or bad because or they are absolutely. not good for everyone. There are for, for consumers, you know, they're on a fixed income, their incomes shrink for... Uh, governments that have debt in foreign currency, their burden increases. But in the long term, for allocating resources, it's something that will tend to allocate resources into tradables, particularly into the export sector, which tends to be associated with faster growth. Makes sense. Um, I'm just going to, you know, quickly sort of uh, get your comment on the the exchange rate in the past decade, if you've seen the data in Pakistan. So it's been very random, right? We were at 65 for the longest time, and suddenly we went from 65 to 100. Then we were at 100 for the longest time, and then suddenly we went from 100 to 150, and then from 150, slowly and steadily, we've you know, raced our way through the through, through 270. And based on the understanding of the real exchange rate, can you tell us a little bit about what, what's been going on over the last decade or so uh, in terms of the the way that the, 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 the currency has sort of evolved? Right. So you you probably can break the, this this period, right? The last 10 years, you can break it in two and you could say, well, uh, what was happening before 2018 20, when there was a substantial depreciation, a move to a, to a competitively priced uh, right. currency, right? So the, the, the State Bank Pakistan moved to a regime in which we can say that we have a, a float uh, or a managed float, right? But basically, it's, it's a competitive... Uh, it's like a free market sort of it's a... sort of a free market, right? In which right. Uh, there may or may not be interventions to control volatility of changes. Uh, but, but it's the essentially are, demand and supply and, you know... Exactly. Right. Exactly. Before then, there was a... a, a let's say that the, the, the exchange rate was preserved at a certain level, uh, the nominal. And because prices kept on growing, right. what happened was that the real exchange rate 
right, that takes into account not only the nominal but also the prices, ended up appreciating. So that means that imports became cheaper gradually and exports became uh, more, ex more, more difficult to, to compete internationally, right? Because domestic costs for exporters were growing, but the whatever the, the rupees they were them, yeah. getting for the dollar they exported, were not, they were not changing. They were sort of fixed, right? right. Uh, so what that did was it eroded to a large extent the capacity of the export sector in Pakistan. So right. if you look at what happened with the export orientation of, of the country as a whole, right? So we moved from uh, having about 16% of GDP explained by exports uh, in 2000 to have today less than 10% explained by, by, by exports. And to a large extent or to a substantial extent, that decline uh, has been uh, encouraged, right, by a, an appreciation exchange rate during three, four, five years, uh, quite sustained, that eroded the profitability of the export sector and turned the economy more into a, a, a consumption-based consumption right? economy. Uh, it's cheaper, to, it was cheaper to buy imported products less, and it was less convenient to, to export. Uh, that, that element, so that the fact that that, that the export sector lost competitiveness for, for a long period of time had long-term implications. And, and I can tell you a little bit more of why I'm saying this. Uh, there is a lot of discussion, and I, I see it in the press a lot. And I come from a country um, and, and from a region. In Latin America, uh, the exporters pay a lot of attention to the exchange rate. They are constantly talking about exchange rates. And, and newspapers are constantly the exchange rate is something that is in the in the newspapers all the time. Right. And when I came here, I kept hearing uh, experts in Pakistan are not sensitive to uh, to the exchange rate. So a depreciation of the rupee is not going to do anything. Particularly when I was coming at the beginning in 2017, that I was coming on 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 short assignments, uh, and there was this discussion: should they should you know should they let the the, the currency uh, freely float? Right. Right. Um, and they would say, you know, the, 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 the exports are not going to react. Exports are insensitive to, to exchange rates. So one of the things I, I did when I moved in here and I, I had a little bit more time to look at these things in detail was, okay, let's, let's look at the data and see what, what is happening. And what we unveiled in a, in a paper that actually I can, I can then share, share with you the, the, the reference so you can, you can add it. Uh, one thing that we saw is, in the long term, Pakistani exports are sensitive to the exchange rate, just like everywhere else in the world. Right. Just like Econ 101 tells us. A 1% depreciation of the rupee, in real terms, increases exports by half a percentage point. A 1% appreciation, in real terms, of the rupee decreases exports by 0.5. And, uh, and, and that's like, there's a, there's a study and there's a paper on that. There's a paper on that, yes. Very interesting. And we have it in our PDU, also, in our Pakistan Development Update. But the interesting thing happens when in the short term. So as I said before, in the long term, this relationship is out there. It happens. Exchange rates and exports are linked. In the short term, what happens is something different, is that exports fall very fast when the exchange rate appreciates. So when the rupee becomes stronger against right. the dollar, right? right? Then it's cheaper to import, it's more costly to export, then exports react very fast. To right. That. So exporters lose markets, right? They lose global buyers because they are not competitive anymore. Reaction quite fast. Right. But when the exchange rate depreciates, right? The, the growth, growth of fast. exports is lower. Right. Right? So why is that? And, and we hear a lot about the, the, oh, there's no export surplus in Pakistan. So we looked, at, we, we looked into this and we found three things that, uh, that are quite interesting. The first one is the exports of what we call in economics homogenous goods react fast, react quickly. But the exports of differentiated goods don't. What is a homogenous good? A homogenous yeah. good is, say, for example, rice, right. is wheat. Right. It is traded in an organized market right with a reference price 
So we know what the international price for basmati rice is. Mo exporters of basmati rice want to go and sell it. There's an organized market. It's relatively straightforward. They, they do many things to be able to export successfully, of course, but the rice is the basmati rice is clearly defined what we're talking about. Same with wheat, mangoes perhaps also. Right. So those ones, exchange rate depreciates, they export more. Fine. Right. Differentiated goods are goods that are not so standard, right? right. So it could be, for example, this cup. Right. This cup is a differentiated good. In some countries, this cup uh, needs to be bigger than this. So the Americans like to drink in big cups. Perhaps the Europeans like smaller cups. Uh, they may like a different color than this one, or they may like uh, the, 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 this handle here to be somewhere else, right? So you need to tailor the product to the needs of the client. Right. So that means that if your opportunity to export in improves, because now the rupee is depreciated, so all of a sudden you're profitable, it's not that you start selling this max anywhere you want. You need right. to go find a client, discuss with your client how is it that their clients are going to like this mug, and tailor the product to their preferences. Decide how you're going to price this. It's not like rice, there's a fixed price, right? And all of that takes time and effort, right? right? It takes uh, what we call market intelligence, and getting that market intelligence takes money. Right. Yeah. So exporters need to get this market intelligence, need to invest in that. And so their their capacity to react to an improvement in, in, in relative prices, in this case, a depreciation exchange rate, is going to be slower. They're going to take longer. The second thing we find in this analysis is something that you're going to say, this is obvious. It is. Right. That is, if you don't get credit, you won't be able to expand. So right. the rupee depreciates, all of a sudden your export product is more profitable. But you don't have the money to invest. You right? can't invest, yeah. you can't buy the machinery you need to scale up. Right. Right. And so if you don't have credit, you won't be able to scale up. But you know, as the personal trainers say, no, no pain, no gain. In this case, it's no credit, no gain. Right. Right? right. If you don't get credit, no gain. So that's why we see that sectors that have access to credit react much faster. Right. And sectors that don't, don't react fast. And the third thing is related to the fact that uh, Pakistani exporters are quite small in the international picture. So right. let me give you a, a, a number. Uh, what we see is that on average, a firm, an exporter of Pakistan, exports in a year $1.4 million on average. An exporter of Bangladesh exports about $3.8 million. So that gives us an idea that, that exporters out of Pakistan are small. Right. If you do a, a, a more thorough uh, analysis, a comparison, you see that Pakistani exporters are at the bottom of the distribution in terms of size. And so what happens when you're small? When happens, what happens when you're small is that you have global buyers that are going to have power to bargain with you. Yeah. Right. And these global buyers are larger. And so when they see that the rupee depreciates, they see, oh, that means that this exporter is making more profit, so I'm going to take some of these profits. If the market was competitive and everyone was the same size, they couldn't do that because the Pakistan exporter would say, I'll choose another global buyer, right? I right, don't want okay. you to take some of my profits. But because the market is not that competitive, global buyers are large and not many, and Pakistani exporters are more and smaller, uh, then the global buyer takes some of these profits, eats some of these uh, profits always called well, in, in economics is called pricing to market. So the global buyer prices whatever they are paying for the input uh, in different markets at different prices, right? Depending on the conditions. So these three things: the fact that you need to pay for information to be able to market your products, the fact that you need credit to expand, and the fact that you're small and so they eat up some of the profits that the that the depreciation gives you determines that. Exports of Pakistan react slowly to depreciations and fast to appreciations. And this is why people say, oh, Pakistani exports won't grow with the depreciation. They will, but very slowly. We'll take time. We'll take time. Right? Um, in this same breath, and you, you talked a lot about, you know, import-led economy or, or consumption economy where, you know, the rupee was essentially made to be stable and, and so import was essentially subsidized or, or made more competitive, right? Um, 
when we look at pakistan we every every single time almost every year we're looking at a balance of payment crisis we're looking at you know some sort of like a trade deficit we're looking at much much more much much higher imports versus the amount uh, you know amount, amount of uh, products that we're exporting essentially um why is it so important for for that for for the exports to and 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 import to have parity essentially or or rather is it important to begin with like is it is it okay for a country i mean when you look at the us they also have a balance of payment crisis or uh, or have like a huge you know debt to to manage so why is it that pakistan or a country like pakistan seems to have to go to like some sort of like a creditor every few years and 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 try to try to bail out the economy when you when you study economics the first thing you need to be able to do to pass the the the, the exams and and get the degree is to learn to answer any question with it depends right so is it good to is it good to run a a, a trade deficit or a trade surplus or to have a balanced trade it depends right right so that's that's the the short answer is it depends so say for example uh if you're a young economy that is growing fast Right. It's receiving a lot of in foreign direct investment. It's very likely that you're importing a lot of capital equipment, machinery, right? right? Uh, you're building domestic capacity, and so you're running a trade deficit, right? So you're importing more than what you're exporting, uh, and that gap is financed because you're receiving all this foreign direct investment, right. or it's, it's financed because investors look at this economy that is growing so fast. Uh, and it's looking so good that they decide to buy bonds of this of this country and you know finance that 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 difference uh, so in that case that trade deficit is is actually if anything is a sign of, of a healthy economy right uh, in a country in which what you see is that investment is not very high uh, and 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 most of Uh, of these imports are explained by high consumption patterns uh, then perhaps that trade deficit is a little bit more uh, complicated to sustain in the sense of uh, it's more difficult to get investors to to pay for that deficit at the end of the day what the trade deficit is showing is that uh, that that there is more demand for dollars and there is supply of dollars right? Right, right because the demand for dollars comes from the importers that want to buy imports and the supply of dollars from the exporters that get the dollars right when they sell right uh, and someone needs to give you that difference right right so if you have someone that is willing to give you that difference in a way that is sustainable in the wrong, long run for the economy say foreign direct investment right it's associated with faster growth in the future then you're happy with that Uh, if instead it's difficult to get these these dollars, or these dollars come at a really high uh, interest rate, for example, then that trade deficit is a little bit more problematic. So I, I, I don't want to say much about the U.S. trade deficit, but one thing that that we know is that the U.S. economy is among the lar- is the largest economy in the world, and so it it gives a little bit of of confidence, confidence to investors, right? That Uh, it can sustain this amount of will debt. Will sustain that amount of debt, right? right. Say Australia is an our, our case, yeah, that has a run an, an endemic uh, trade deficit, but investors are happy to 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 continue investing in in Australia, right? right. So uh, when it comes to ex- uh, exports, particularly, and 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 with imports, we we did see. I mean, we've seen the the you know there there has been particularly with CPAC, there was a lot of foreign direct investment coming in and machineries coming in, so there was that sort of a deficit as well. But then we also saw there was at a time we had a very hugely consumption led economy, and so essentially we were just importing stuff and we were that just going poof in in the air, and it wasn't really producing anything in the long run for us. Um, and so imports, I feel like at this point in time, even people have that understanding where they're like, okay. Consumption-based goods that are imported, maybe we can't afford that right now. But in terms of exports, we haven't seen a very major change over the last, I would say, two decades. You know, as a matter of fact, if anything, we've seen you know textile exports falling at, at, in certain times as well. Um, and then it's just like been textile or surgical goods. Like we've been I've, I've, growing up in this country, you know, that's all I've heard. You know, we have surgical goods or sports goods or, or textile, and that's. Pretty much it. Some some agriculture here or there, but that's it. What has stopped, considering particularly in this region, if you look at it, you know, India or Vietnam or Bangladesh, um, you know, countries have been doing a remarkable job 
uh, in terms of and and we've all heard China's story as well in terms of diversifying in terms of really sort of being a part of the global economy um, but with Pakistan unfortunately we haven't been able to see that same growth take shape what are what are some of the major reasons in in your opinion um, let me the- mention one or let me say let me start by saying it's self-inflicted right okay so the 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 fact that export competitiveness uh, has has faded is 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 completely self-inflicted and let me tell you why i think it's self-inflicted basically this country is among the most protected countries in the world okay right? uh, import duties come in three different flavors uh, there is something called a customs duty on top of that there is a regulatory duty and on top of that there's an additional customs duty right. right if you add them up right that's the total import duty on average they are at 20% and that places pakistan among the top 5 most protected economies in the world right these high import duties are not for a specific type of product they are across the board so import duties are high when you look at consumer goods particularly high very high but they are also high when you look at machinery equipment and they are also high when you look at intermediates right so import duties are high it's not just that they are high is that their structure is particularly tilted against exports So the, the structure of import duties introduces an anti-export bias, and you may be thinking he's talking about import duties. What does this have to do with exports? So I'll get there in a minute. But basically, what is the structure of import duties in Pakistan? Well, Pakistan applies something that that in in in, in trade is called cascading of tariffs. That is, the tariff is much higher on the final good than it is. on the intermediate or raw material that you need to produce it. This is the case in most countries in the world. Right. Most countries in the world have a cascading tariff structure. Why? Because what you want to do is you want to incentivize firms to industrialize, to produce things at home. And so you say, okay, fine, you can import the intermediates and raw materials at a relatively low tariff, yeah? But I'm going to protect you from import competition on the final good. Right. Yeah? So, if you need the ceramic to produce this mug, you can import it at a low tariff right? right but i'm going to put a high enough tariff on the mug, the mug the itself mug, yeah. so you're protected so we call that effective protection protection that takes into account the tariff on the final good but also the tariff on the intermediates you need to produce it in terms of effective protection pakistan has the second highest in the world rates of effective protection what do this do to export competitiveness well it does the following high effective protection means that you're giving me so if you're putting the effective protection i'm the domestic firm i have two options right one option is i can sell domestically the other option is i can get all this headache of exporting right you're giving me such a comfortable domestic market protected right right from international competition that for me the option is very clear even if you if you didn't give me any effective protection in general firms are more comfortable selling at home because the home market is much more uh it's easier to reach right, right? it's transport costs but also cultural preferences you know they know what products they, they, their customers like right so even if the government didn't do anything firms are going to prefer first to sell domestic but with high effective protection what happens is that for firms is a non starter of course they're going to sell domestically and so exporting becomes only a residual option for firms because it's so profitable to sell in the domestic market and right. there's even from a semantics point of view in pakistan they talk about export surplus yeah so this is something i never heard elsewhere right so i never heard elsewhere people talking about export surplus so i whenever they talk about export surplus what is this so i went to the dictionary so the oxford dictionary defines export surplus as the difference between exports and imports so it's right. net exports right. in pakistan it doesn't mean that in pakistan export surplus means whatever you produce and you don't sell domestically right and the domestic market doesn't absorb that's 
the export surplus, is the rest, right? Is the residual option. Right. And the fact that it's mentioned that way is consistent with a, a, a tariff structure, right? Uh, that is anti-export. So the, the high import duties are essentially and implicitly high export duties. So they are, the duties are placed on, are levied on imports, mm -hmm. but their effects are on deterring exports. So if, for example, just to, uh, so when you mentioned, let's, let's look at the example of a mug. What you're essentially saying is that if, if the government reduces the tariff on the raw material, the ceramic, and increases the tariff on the mug, it's still not going to increase the exports? It's going to increase domestic production, probably. It's going to increase the profits of the mug maker, right? Right. Uh, but it's not necessarily going to reflect on the exports. It will certainly not show in the exports. In fact, if anything, it will show negatively on the exports. Because this mug maker will receive a much higher price domestically, because domestically the price is going to be whatever the international price is, mm -hmm. plus the import duty on the mug. Right. Right? Because any producer abroad will not be able to penetrate the domestic market in Pakistan at a price lower than that. It's the international price plus this duty. Right. Yeah? So that gives margin, that gives a lot of space for the producer domestically to sell at, at that high price or a little bit below perhaps. Right, but that's sort of the the, the minimum uh, that 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 an import an imported mug will cost. Right, and it's also going to essentially going to incentivize smuggling or, or or trying to evade all sorts of duties or whatever as well. In my that's mind. true. It will incentivize smuggling, but even in a world without smuggling, it, and and you're right, it will incentivize smuggling. But even in a world without smuggling, even if you could perfectly enforce your border controls, right? Even in that case. The high import duty creates extra profits for the domestic firm that chooses to sell domestically. Right. And so it increases incentives to focus on the domestic market at the expense of the foreign market. Right. And this is why import duties are called import duties, but for all purposes, they are export taxes. Right. And so if I understand this correctly, um, and it's a lot of things to process. <laughs> but if I understand this correctly, what you're essentially saying is that we're doing, we've always been doing two things very, very wrong. The right metric to give export competitiveness is actually the currency or the free float of the currency where the demand and supply will define the price of the, of the currency essentially, not protecting it through tariffs. Is that correct? Because government has tried to sort of protect the local export industry, but not through uh, you know, letting the currency incentivize them, but rather, yeah. Tariffs only protect the producer that chooses the domestic market. Right. Tariffs don't protect the exporter. They actually deter their, exporter. their incentive to export. Right? right? They reduce their incentive to export. What the tariff does is it impedes competition, right? Impedes innovation and makes firms focus on a protected domestic market. That's what tariffs do. Instead, you're right, a depreciated currency, again, and remember what we were discussing in the beginning, that's many other things, right? So I'm not saying that it's, a, it's what we want. I'm, I'm just saying from the export-import point of view, what a depreciated currency does is it makes imports more expensive, right? Right. And it makes exports cheaper. So right. more competitive. Uh, so, so it's more likely that a trade deficit will be uh, corrected with a depreciation of currency than with import duties increasing. Because the import duties increasing, yes, increase the, the import price paid at, you know, uh, domestically, but it also introduces this anti-export bias. Right, right, right. Makes a lot of sense. Um, in, in, in your analysis, um, do you, have you seen ample amounts of investment at least ever since we've sort of have like had like a free float market or, or a floating exchange rate um, since 2018, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. 
have you seen investment going into the to, to the export sector even if you know like you said it takes a while to sort of reflect um but have we seen any uh you know essentially positive early signs that could that could say you know maybe we might be seeing some sort of a growth in the coming years in the export sector so most of the fdi that pakistan receives so if one focuses on the on the foreign investment right there's also right. domestic investment that is actually m- more substantive no uh but if one focuses on on foreign direct investment most of the foreign direct investment focuses on uh on on what we call market seeking investment so investment that looks into selling in the in the domestic market rather than using pakistan as an export platform right there are exceptions of course but uh in fact we are we we are in the process of of doing analysis on this and one of the things that we see is that most fdi uh, is 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 in in the market seeking segments right exploiting domestic rather than export uh markets and so the thing is all of this is a uh, you know the, the challenge with exporting or of development in general is 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 a combination of many things that interact so yes you need a you need a competitively priced currency but you also need less cascading so you also need import duties that are lower right if you keep the import duties very high you will continue to attract fdi that is market seeking right right that it will not use pakistan as a platform for exporting that it will exploit the fact that markets are very protected in Pakistan and so it will come set shop in Pakistan and take advantage of the high protection uh so we still see uh, that trend that most of the of the of the investment received focuses on the domestic market rather than on 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 building a platform for exporting right um you know one of the things that but particularly you know a lot of um, commentators in Pakistan are are aiming for in the coming years what they're saying is you know China obviously has is now going more towards high value goods uh, they have an aging population and so they they need they have a smaller amount of people who can work and and a larger population that they need to sustain and so automatically some of the lower value goods that they're still looking to export in in Africa for example in in Middle East um they can't afford to um sort of produce anymore like it's it's become too expensive for them um and what they're saying is okay so in pakistan you have this huge youth population that's essentially you know a lot, large part of that is jobless or at least jobless in a way that it's not really high value production or, or in their own relative context um and they're saying you know maybe a lot of this industry might be able to they, they might be able to move that to pakistan which is export focused so we saw um i do believe there is a, within the faisalabad industrial zone there were a couple of these like ceramic uh, tile companies and tire companies and and even you know we recently heard of uh, phones that were assembled in pakistan that were eventually exported to to the middle east um do you think if we look at uh, you know that that could actually potentially prove beneficial uh for for pakistan's economy do you think the the variables here do not make sense or the fundamentals don't make sense for something like this to happen i i think they 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 make sense to some extent so i i think pakistan is already gaining from these shifts that we see uh in in production structures in china and it will continue to benefit right so right. i'll give you one example what is happening with denim uh so denim exports out of pakistan are growing substantially uh and if you look at if you look at imports for example from the united states uh and and you look at the composition who are the exporters and you see that exports out of china to uh the us are growing but very like single digits and exports out of pakistan to the us of denim are were growing at 60% in the first quarter right, right. Uh, of this of this year uh if you talk to any ex- producers exporters they are telling they are going to tell you that they are close to full capacity and and to a l- large extent this is because there has been some reorientation right so global buyers that are not buying from china anymore because china is doing something else so certainly uh, pakistan will take advantage of of these shifts and it should pay a lot of attention actually to these shifts and uh from an investment promotion point of view uh i think the board of investment uh, should be looking at how is it that they're going to get all these firms to come into pakistan and, and do it um but what we know you know when you think about development is as countries develop 
they they keep adding more products into their baskets, right? right? So it's not that they change and say, okay, now instead of exporting denim, I'm going to export uh, space rockets. No, it doesn't happen that way, right? You continue exporting denim, but you start adding things that are more sophisticated. And so I think it's also important that that Pakistan looks ahead and thinks, okay, what is uh, what is coming, right? What are the new sectors that are coming and what is the infrastructure that is needed to attract investments in these sectors and how can we bring pioneers uh, into into Pakistan? I think that's a, so that was definitely going to be my next question as well. And it's nice that you ended with it with that. Obviously, when you're looking at a, Particularly, you know, you're looking at trade. You're looking at it in a, in a Pakistani context, but you're, you're also looking at the world, right? If I were to ask you, you know, what do you understand in terms of you've been here for two years, you've been able to see the industry, seen the infrastructure, seen um, the capability, um, you know, what we do have locally and what we don't have maybe. And so in terms of potential, uh, how would I put it? Um, you know, potential opportunities for Pakistan to grow in different sectors. So beyond the textile and the and the sporting goods and the surgical, are there any new areas where we might a decade from now see that, oh, you know, Pakistan grew rapidly if all things go perfectly as they should? Um, what are the opportunities in the, in the overall export realm globally uh, that Pakistan could easily, sort of like a low hanging fruit that Pakistan could benefit from? So look, there, there's, there's, you can think about this in two ways. So one way is the way you, you put it. What are the new sectors, perhaps, that, that can be uh, coming up? Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. But let me first twist your question around a little bit, because I think it would be interesting to think not so much uh, about new sectors, but why, what, what if we think about new ways of doing things? Right. The same things, but in new ways. And, right. and I'll tell you where I'm going with this. Um, so, for example, the, the, the garment sector, Pakistan has a comparative advantage, right? And it will continue having a comparative advantage, and it creates a lot of jobs. And you still want these jobs to be there, but you want them to be better paid, and you want them to adapt to the new uh, developments that are happening. And one thing that is coming, and it's, it's here already, but, but it's, it's, it's coming at a high, uh, at Speak, a fast yeah. pace, is... Um, climate change and with climate change <laughs> with climate change one of the things that we see is that sectors will need to start decarbonizing to be able to be competitive and when i say competitive is to be uh, demanded by clients right so there, there are two parts of this story one one point is actually uh you know, re reducing the, the pace of, of climate change, that is a substantial point. The other point is a demand point. Right. Consumers more and more want products uh, that, that have are a low carbon green, footprint. That yeah. have a low carbon footprint. So the most important thing for the, the export sector in Pakistan, the production, the, in general, the productive sector, but oh, the export sector in particular. Yeah, yeah. So I was just looking at the COP26 and, and Interloop has done a great job. Oh, exactly. wow. Exactly. Right, 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 um, right. And so one of the things that you want is you want the private sector and the public sector to start thinking together. How are we going to move into decarbonization? And how are we going to certify our products so that we right. can get the higher price in international markets and so that we can avoid the, the, the carbon border, the, the carbon tax, right? The, yeah. the border adjustment that will likely happen sooner or later uh, that developed countries will start imposing to avoid this carbon leakage, right, story. Uh, so to get higher prices, to avoid paying the carbon tax in, in, in export markets, uh, the private sector needs to start thinking very, they are already doing it, huh? uh, but, but we need more of that. And so perhaps rather than thinking only about new sectors, let's also think about how the old sectors can become new sources of growth, upgrade in terms of, uh, uh, you know, environmental sustainability that also ends up uh, being an upgrade in terms of the price you get. So that's one part of the story. Right. The other part of the story is more directly related to what you were asking. What are the, the sectors uh, that are upcoming? And there, uh, one thing that sometimes uh, we, we, we sort of overlook is the, the knowledge-intensive services exports 
that come out of Pakistan that are growing very fast and that are uh, sometimes overlooked and, and in part hidden because of problems with statistics, right? When I say knowledge intensive services experts, I mean software developers, I mean architects or engineers that sell their products abroad. All of this was, uh, you know, it became sort of the talk of the town with the, with the pandemic, with the COVID-19 pandemic because of telework. So people in the U.S. realized that actually they, 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 need, they didn't need to have their supplier you know, of next, whatever next door, service yeah. next door, they could have it in Pakistan or somewhere else. Right. But if you look at the data, it was happening far before COVID, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. Outsourcing has been happening for, for a long part time, of, yeah. right? So if you look at the last 15 years, the, if you look at the services export bundle of Pakistan uh, in fiscal year uh, 06, so in 2015-16, so, sorry, 2006-56, exports of knowledge intensive uh, services were 10% of services experts. Today, they are 50% of services experts, right? right? So that's a sector that is growing. It's a sector that, that is combining dynamism with quality upgrading, right? right? And it's a sector that will continue in there. So policymakers need to look at how, A, you attract investment so that it's not just freelancers. It's great that you have a lot of freelancers, but also that you have big companies coming in, right? right? And, and leveraging low labor costs and, and, and skills that are available in the market. Um, that you give them the freedom to move money in and out of Pakistan. Because if right. you cannot move money out, you will not bring it in, right? right? right. Uh, and that's a problem, and that's why a, a lot of these services experts are underreported, because the money doesn't end up coming in, right? right. It stays right. in Dubai or it stays in accounts elsewhere. Right. Um, so that, that's a sector that is going to be increasingly uh, more relevant in that it employs uh, a lot of people in different skills levels, right? So we, a lot of the outsourcing happens at relatively low skills. A lot of the outsourcing happens at really high skills, right? Uh, so that, that is coming. Um, and then the other thing that should be considered very seriously is taking advantage of the China-Pakistan free trade agreement. Pakistan uh, doesn't have many free trade agreements or preferential trade agreements. The one that it has that is comprehensive is with China. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, low-hanging fruit is in taking more advantage of that agreement, uh, integrating a little bit more in a regional value chain with Chinese firms. Uh, and that will require support from the public sector also, support to firms, particularly to smaller firms, uh, that could be taking advantage of those preferences and currently are not because they don't know much about the market uh, and, uh, and, and they, could, they could actually profit quite a lot. So three things, doing things in a different way, reducing carbon footprint, advertising it and certifying that so that you can get a higher price and you can jump the taxes that are, go that are going to come very soon. Second, services and particularly knowledge intensive sectors services and third take advantage of china as a as a as a growth pole and embrace that link right right um gonzalo this was extremely insightful thank you so much for 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 sharing all of that detail if i if i were to for the for the consumers if they had to have to check out this report what's the easiest way to find it so if you if you google uh pakistan development update 2021 reviving exports you get to the link right okay, so we have perfect. in our in our website uh, is is right there. Awesome. Uh, so. And and Fazan, if you could just link that in the description below as well, um, I think that'd be great as well. We could just sort of give them directly. Gonzalo, thank you so much for coming in, taking the time out, uh, you know, sharing all that insight. The economy certainly makes so much more sense to me now uh, on what's going on and, and, and what are the major things that we need to do uh, in the coming years, particularly for, for a lot of young people who are watching. Um, they don't have that. They didn't have for the longest time that fundamental understanding. And, and it's a lot of young people who are now disrupting, uh, you know, coming up with new ideas, disrupting the way that things were done before. They just require that sort of guidance. Unfortunately, a lot of which isn't available at this point in time. But thank you so much for, you know, doing this and, and sharing all the insight.
Thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Awesome. And for all of you guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this episode, please do share it with your friends. For YouTube, if you like this, uh, like the video, we're going to have more engagement and, uh, you know, it's going to reach more people. Uh, for audio platforms, you can press the subscribe button and you're going to get notifications for the, uh, for the upcoming episodes. For Facebook users, you can join the link below it's of the TBD community where we share different articles, uh, take your insight, um, you know, get, take guest recommendations as well. So you can join that. We have an easy press of jazz cash thing appearing here. So you can uh, support the channel. We accept anything from repeat as much as you'd like it's a thought that counts but anyways this was Sayyid Muslim Lesson Zaidi you are watching Thought Behind Things thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one